believe in science? Well, hey, that was pretty affirmative. I don't think I got everybody, though. How about this? The ones I missed. Do you believe in science? OK, now, how about this? Have you entered into a personal relationship with empirical data? Yeah, okay, good, yes, yeah, some are still nodding, right? Some are like, yes, I know my data, and my data knows me. <laughs> All right, good. OK, now, back to my original question. Let's see. Everybody, do you believe in science? Yeah. Good, OK. Well, this question, this question about whether or not we believe in science, has become one of the most divisive topics of conversation today. It's causing horrible political divides, devastating social divides. And worse, it's causing divides in families and communities. We in academia tend to point our fingers at others. We call them anti-intellectual, voluntarily ignorant, the enemies of evidence. And then when they turn around and call us elitists, we take it as a compliment. Psst, it's not a compliment. In 16 days, April 22nd, belief in science will take center stage as scientists and science enthusiasts across the nation march in a great Earth Day demonstration. I'll be there. I've recruited an extroverted friend to sign me up for scooping potato salad. I figure I can hide social anxiety behind starch and mayonnaise. I'll be there even though I don't believe in science, and even though I'm asking you not to believe in it either. Oh, I know, wrong crowd, right? But don't worry, it'll be OK. I will be there because I think that science literacy is a matter of life and death. And I support anybody who wants to make that easier to attain. I am here because science literacy needs to start here with us, the science communicators. We need to think about how we communicate before we go marching down Main Street and try to come up with witty chants that will win hearts and minds. I don't think we've been doing a very good job of winning hearts and minds lately. In fact, the opposite. I think we've been losing hearts and minds. It happened pretty bigly in November. During the 2016 Democratic National Convention, I Believe in Science became a major rallying cry. Speaking on her commitment to fight global warming, Hillary Clinton declared, I believe in science, an echo of what former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley had said about her in his speech. Hillary Clinton, like you and me, believes in science. It was O'Malley, in fact, who said that Donald Trump doesn't believe in the science. Well, to his credit, Donald Trump had never said that he didn't believe in science. In, in a conversation with the Washington Post's Fred Hyatt, he had said, I'm not a great believer in man-made climate change. And he'd even gone as far as to say that global warming was a hoax perpetuated by China. <laughs> These claims were misled. Possibly mendacious, to be sure. But what made them particularly troubling is that they were just borrowing language that the Democrats were already using to talk about science, the language of belief, which allows us to ignore that science is a social process of testing ideas, interpreting data, and then coming up with new ideas to test, not this, this thing, this entity that tells us what to think and how to behave because we all know how much the human species likes to be told what to think and how to behave. The language of belief suggests that evidence-based conclusions are matters of faith. Essentially, it turns science into a god. And don't get me wrong, science is usually benevolent, offering advice that even I and my colleagues in the humanities can get behind. As in Elite Dailies, science says reading books may actually make you live longer. <laughs> but the problem is that lately, science has come to dictate things about our private, sacred spaces. Spaces which need to be known intuitively as well as cognitively. Spaces that have traditionally been the domain of religion. Science has come to dictate everything from how children should be raised, as in NPRs, how to raise brilliant children, according to science, to how much sex an individual should have, 
as in Medical Express is, why science says you should have more sex. It is even claimed to determine matters of love and eternity, as in the Atlantic's, there's no such thing as everlasting love, according to science. Well, that's inspiring. We might think that this is harmless rhetorical flair, clickbait, right? But the problem is that when we turn science into a god, science is going to encounter the same challenge faced by any deity. What do you do when people stop believing? But you can't choose not to believe in science, we say. Science is factual and evidence-based. No, actually, that's where we've been wrong. And this, I think, is where our conversation is breaking down. Science here is personification. It gives a name, a voice, and an intelligence to data or to the natural forces governing those data. But actually, data doesn't speak. It can't interpret itself. It requires people, researchers, communicators to interpret it. And so when you say science says, Actually, you probably mean that a researcher has interpreted his or her data to mean whatever it is you're about to tell me, and that a peer review board has accepted that conclusion as plausible. So when we personify science then, we're allowed to forget that actually, we're talking about human beings here, men and women who are involved in rich, vibrant conversations. And we're allowed to imagine instead that this great ethereal entity has spoken from the realm of natural law to tell us things like cockroach milk is the next superfood, <laughs> or that the secret to a happy marriage is drinking together, or that liberals, not conservatives, are psychotic, or that a childhood vaccine has been linked to autism. OK, but look, I'm not here to metaphor shame anybody. We need metaphor in order to communicate science. From time to time, researchers will have a need for language that signifies things that are too vast or too complex to be expressed fully. Albert Einstein called that experience an encounter with the mysterious. He said, the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious and that he was satisfied with the humble attempt to understand even a tiny portion of the reason that manifests itself in nature. Because scientific inquiry takes for granted that the universe and its processes are intelligible, interaction with the mysterious feels like interaction with an intelligent entity. So it's natural for us to personify that entity and to give it names like science or as Einstein has done in his essay, Nature. So this science says problem is mostly a problem for popular journalism, memes, and phrases tossed around in conversation or on bumper stickers. Most scientists are not going to use science says or according to science in scholarly articles. I think that's because researchers are keenly aware of their place within a sometimes contentious conversation, and there's also this lovely thing called imposter syndrome. Scientists will, however, personify nature all the dang time. Think about it. Think about this phrase, natural selection. What is selection but the act of carefully choosing someone or something over another? That's a human act. In order to select something, I need to have some intelligence and free will. And yes, evolutionary biologists have given the phrase natural selection a new definition that includes things like environmental and genetic influences and something about the thriving of organisms. But that doesn't change the fact that this phrase is and has always been personification. Not convinced? All right, how about this? In February of 2016, the Open Access Medical Journal, Plus One, published an article by a team of Italian researchers led by Simone Giardini called On Nature's Strategy for Assigning Genetic Code Multiplicity. In this article, the authors personify nature as an intelligent agent that strategizes, makes decisions, and even leaves hidden messages for the researchers to interpret. The researchers said, 
that uh, their purpose was to find the origins of standard genetic code bias code on assignment for incorporating all the amino acids that have survived nature's selection. Notice, by the way, the capital letter indicating the proper noun. All right. I know. I'm not going to ask you not to believe in nature. I don't think that nature is as dangerous as science because it doesn't give the impression that the claims of a single researcher or research team are somehow the words of a, a, an omniscient deity. But I will ask you to consider that when you reference nature, you are actually gesturing towards something supernatural. Nature is the physical force regarded as causing and regulating the phenomena of the world. If we follow that through, then nature must have existed before the phenomena of the world in order to cause it. And it must exist beyond the phenomena of the world in order to regulate it. So therefore, it is supernatural. OK, so maybe I should ask you, do you believe in nature? Oh, now we start to get into a bit of a tangle, don't we? Right? Because although I've asked you not to talk about science like it's a god, but nature. For centuries, we've toyed with the idea of nature as divinity. We can call that pantheism. 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza was a major proponent of this idea, and Einstein was a fan of Spinoza's. So yeah, when you're referencing nature, you are actually gesturing towards something supernatural. In some philosophies, you're gesturing toward a kind of divinity. OK. But what if we say it in another language? What if we say it in Chinese? What if, instead of nature, we say zhou? And what if, when we translate zhou, Back into English, it becomes creator. Oh, no, absolutely not. Whack job humanities professor on the stage. Who let her in here? <laughs> no, no, no. Bear with me on this, please. Because last year, something happened that I'm afraid is going to rock the relationship between science communicators and their audience for a long time. If we don't decide here, together, today, that we reject this event and its outcome. One month before the publication of On Nature Strategy, Plus One published an article by a team of researchers led by Ming-Jin Liu of China's Huazhan University of Science and Technology. It was just a small study about the link between the hand structure and its function. For two months, nothing happened. Then, in early March, the paper started to go viral. Plus One began receiving complaints about language in the article. The complaints focused on three separate sentences, which were scattered throughout the 16-page report, each of which made reference to a creator. The term appeared in the paper's abstract, introduction, and conclusion, and it was used similarly each time. The authors felt that their study indicated that the hand's mechanical architecture is the proper design by the creator for dexterous performance. OK. So the first comment was posted to the article on Plus One's website on the 2nd of March by a reader who identified himself as Dr. Leonid Schneider, cell biologist turned science journalist. Schneider wrote that, even if he should not be able to convince the authors, editors, and peer reviewers of the study of the non-existence of a divine creator, he wished that they would consider that humans occasionally use their hand as a tool of masturbation, one of a multitude of daily tasks performed in a comfortable way. Masturbation is a sinful activity according to most religions. Thus, the hand must not have been divine, uh, created by a divine creator, but in fact possibly by the devil himself to lead the humanity and other apes into temptation. Yeah. Within, 70, within, within, a, within a few hours, about 70 comments had been posted to the article, most of which were nasty, disparaging, insulting, and downright rude. Yes, folks, trolls wear lab coats too. <laughs> the controversy spread to, so, to social media with the creation of two new hashtags, hashtag creatorgate and hashtag hand of God. 
Lou tried to explain that the word in his head was actually Jehu, which can be translated as either nature or creator. But by the 4th of March, two days after the first complaints had been posted online, Plus One had received such a barrage of criticisms that the journal issued a retraction of the article. This was a problem. This was a bad thing because it was a double standard. Because although it's true that science can't prove the existence of a divine, intelligent creator, it's also true that science can't prove the existence of an intelligent nature. But nobody bats an eye at the use of the term nature in scientific discourse. And that's hypocritical. And frankly, I'm afraid that if we allow this one perspective to dominate the conversation, then it's that kind of hypocrisy which is going to further isolate us from our audience, who overwhelmingly and increasingly do believe in a divine intelligent creator. You may have heard that religious nuns, that is, people who are not affiliated with any particular religion, are on the rise in America. But you may be surprised to hear that they are on the decline globally. By 2050, religious nuns are expected to decline from 16% of the population to 13% of the world's population. And even then, religious nuns does not mean atheists. In fact, a Pew study of religious nuns in America found that over two-thirds of religious nuns said that they believe in God. More than half said that they feel a deep connection to nature and the earth. More than a third classified themselves as spiritual, though not religious, and one in five said that they pray every day. So yeah, our audience, and yes, even the majority of scientists, are willing to accept that a divine intelligence might be a possibility. And yet here we are, publicly mocking references to God in scientific articles, while in the same breath we'll talk about science like it's a God. We call our critics anti-intellectual. Aren't we being anti-intuitive? Anti-empathetic? Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson once observed that a careful reading of older texts shows that authors invoke divinity only when they reach the boundaries of their understanding. They appeal to a higher power only when staring into the ocean of their own ignorance. That's true. But what Tyson overlooks is that every researcher will have to encounter the ocean of their own ignorance. And it's the experience of that limitation, the experience of the mysterious, which sustains the curiosity that leads to scientific progress. Ming Jin Liu encountered it when contemplating the perfection of the hand's design. Simone Giardini encountered it when contemplating the mystery of genetic code redundancy. To suggest, in fact, that there will one day no longer be a need to reference the mysterious imposes more limits on the future of scientific inquiry than does a personification of that mysterious. It suggests that there will be no need for scientists or scientific investigation because everything in the universe will be known and that fullness of knowledge will be conceived in the mind of each individual. That's not going to happen. And so I'm here asking you to give up your belief in science. Because I don't think that science is a very good name for the mysterious. Science is what we do. It's how we interact with the mysterious. We can't let that be forgotten. But on the same hand, we also have to accept that references to divinity are not only normal in scientific discourse, sometimes they're necessary. Scientism, the belief in the supremacy of the scientific method and the rejection of all beliefs that cannot be proven empirically is an idea that should be debated in philosophical discourse, not indiscriminately acted upon within the pages of the scientific article. We have to stop presenting science as a deity that wants to dethrone the god of our audience's faith. We need to invite all faiths into scientific communication. We need to show that science is nonpartisan and non-denominational. We need to invite everyone to talk about and embrace the mysterious. It is, after all, the most beautiful experience we can have. Thank you.